Good morning, everybody, and welcome. My name is William Knoll. I'm the director of the Kislak Center. Um, and on behalf of President Gutman, Constantia Constantinou, the Vice Provost, and H. Carton Rogers, the third director of libraries, um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, to Sound, Gender, and the Color Line, a symposium and celebration in honor of Marian Anderson, musician and citizen of the world, which is a major collaboration between the Kislak Center, Penn's music department, and many, many other uh, uh, Penn organizations. Uh, President Gutman couldn't make it in person, um, so uh, she sent a letter that I would like to read out. Greetings and welcome to Penn. She had the voice that the great Toscanini said is heard only once in a hundred years. But more than that, she had the will, determination, and spirit that was for the ages. How wonderful to get today to gather together in celebration of Philadelphia's own Marian Anderson, renowned musician and citizen of the world. It is more than fitting that Penn's own Kislak Center and departments of music and of Africana studies should organize this symposium and tonight's concert in honor of one of the greatest musicians of the 20th century. In 1977, Marian Anderson began donating her private papers and materials to Penn and continued to do so up until her death at the age of 96 in 1993. There are more than 4,000 photographs in the collection and more than 500 boxes of related materials, including diaries, programs, and scrapbooks from an astonishing career that took her from a segregated childhood in South Philadelphia to nearly all the great concert venues in the world. Most famous of all was her Easter Sunday concert in 1939 on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Introduced by the United States Secretary of the Interior, her performance was broadcast around the nation by all the major radio stations and witnessed by an audience of more than 75,000 people. The enduring image of Americans of all races seated peacefully together in rows stretching nearly to the horizon is one of the iconic images of the civil rights movement then in its infancy. It would be reflected so powerfully three, three decades later when Martin Luther King told the world of his dream from those same steps. If Dr. King gave testament to America's enduring ideal of freedom, it was Marian Anderson who first expressed that vision in song. By remembering Marian Anderson today, you celebrate the kind of courage and conviction that is the wellspring of personal and national greatness. I applaud your work and wish you a successful and productive gathering. Sincerely, Amy Gutman. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to uh, to ask uh, Professor Emeritus uh, of Music at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Lawrence Bernstein, to come to the podium and kick things off. He was instrumental in bringing the collection of Marian Anderson to Penn, Professor Bernstein. Good morning and welcome to this unique symposium and celebration honoring Marian Anderson. It's a signal honor for me to have been asked to open these distinguished proceedings. My connection with this symposium is by way of the collection of Miss Anderson's papers in our library, which makes Penn, the University of Pennsylvania, the perfect venue for a gathering like this one. This connection takes us back to the mid-1970s when I chaired the music department. No one really wanted that job. It involves a lot of busy work, even more politics, and an endless array, it seems, of hands, all demanding to be held. It did have its high points, however, as when one could participate in convincing a bright and talented young person to join the faculty or to nurture the career of such a, co a colleague. For me, however, even such capstone moments paled in comparison to an unparalleled opportunity that came my way. One morning, out of the blue, I received a telephone call from James DePriest, the distinguished American conductor. Maestro DePriest was a Penn alum and, of course, the nephew of Miss Anderson. He was very close to his aunt, and he had an intimate knowledge of the extraordinary value of her papers. He had assumed the responsibility to see that this priceless record of her career would be properly preserved. 
To the great good fortune of the University of Pennsylvania, Maestro de Priest saw both symmetry and wisdom in depositing these inestimably valuable papers in Philadelphia, the city of Miss Anderson's birth. And Penn, his alma mater, seemed to him the logical destination for this collection. From me, he wanted help on two fronts. First, could I convey to him the university's assurance that it would lavish on these papers the exquisite care they warranted? And second, could I help him assure Miss Anderson that this was an important thing to do? The first request to get the university behind this project was the easiest administrative task I ever took on. At every level, library administration, special collections, music library, office of development, and department of music, there was instantaneous recognition that this venture needed to be assigned the highest priority. The second request to help convince Ms. Anderson seemed potentially a greater challenge to me. What might the logistics of carrying this out be, I wondered to Mr. De Priest. He seemed altogether nonchalant in his response to me. We'll just drive out to the farm in Connecticut where she lives and talk to her. My reaction to that suggestion was not nearly as casual. Frankly, the prospect of meeting Miss Anderson made me quite nervous. I had met a reasonable number of important people. I had never met a legend. I found myself wondering about how you carry on a conversation with a legend. <laughs> the date for the meeting was set. I took the train to New York and met Mr. DePriest and his wife Jeanette at their Upper West Side apartment, and the three of us set out for the drive to Mariana Farm in Danbury, Connecticut. The conversation in the car was wide-ranging, animated, and genial, which left me with good feelings I retain to this day. Nothing, however, could ameliorate my insecurities about the gross disproportion I anticipated on contemplating the imminent conversation between this iconic figure and me. Nothing could ameliorate them, that is, except for Miss Anderson herself, and it took her all of 30 seconds to do so. I am amazed still about how much Miss Anderson conveyed to me in that compact expanse of time. I was literally washed over with feelings of warmth and welcome, with an awareness of her quiet dignity and grandeur, with the depth of her concern about me. Somehow she managed to figure out on the basis of very little evidence that I would be comfortable with kosher food and she quickly arranged for me to have it. The legend, in short, was real. It was not hard to convince Miss Anderson of the wisdom of depositing her papers at Penn. Her nephew had obviously done much to pave the way for this. But I think she also took comfort in the knowledge that the definitive record of her life's achievements would come to reside just a mile from her various childhood homes in South Philadelphia, and not much farther away from the site of the Union Baptist Church, which had recognized her musical talent from the earliest age. In the spring of 1977, Miss Anderson agreed to donate her papers to the university. The next few years saw a flurry of activity to raise funds for the preservation and cataloging of the materials, culminating in a gala benefit recital by Luciano Pavarotti at the Mann Center in West Philadelphia. That sold out event raised considerable resources, both for maintaining the papers and to establish Marian Anderson performance scholarships for deserving students at the university. Many members of the Penn community worked hard to assure that the Anderson papers would be cared for properly. Among them was Nita Westlake, a noted authority on Theodore Dreiser, and at the time curator of the Rare Books Collection at Van Pelt. To her felt the vital task of sifting through the vast array of materials and arranging them in ways that would render them most readily accessible. The fruits of her labor are perhaps most directly, directly visible in the catalog of the collection she edited, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in 1981. Cataloging the music in the collection, a hundred boxes of it, required special skills, and these were provided by the catalog's co-editor, Otto Albrecht, a founding member of the music department at Penn, and a distinguished music bibliographer and avid bibliophile. In a gesture that brought him immense happiness, the music library on the fourth floor of Van Pelt Library was named for him. Beyond the bibliographical expertise Otto brought to the catalog of the Anderson papers, and to his enormous delight, 
He also uncovered a monstrous gaffe in the first proofs for a fundraising brochure on behalf of the preservation of the papers. Otto was, if anything, the most cosmopolitan of men. He traveled the whole world constantly and was fluent in more languages than we could count. He took great pleasure at catching his colleagues in any kind of linguistic blunder. The Office of Development was charged with producing a brochure for potential donors to the Marian Anderson Fund. With good reason in compiling the text for this brochure, they gave pride of place to one of the greatest treasures among the Anderson papers, the autograph of a song, Solitude, by the great Finnish composer Jan Sibelius. He had dedicated the work to Miss Anderson in 1939. One day, Otto strode into my office, grinning from ear to ear. In his hand was the first proof of the fundraising brochure. Read this, Otto commanded, pointing to the opening sentence of the brochure. It began, Jan Sibelius, best known for his tone poem Finlandia and Norway's most famous composer. <laughs> We're deeply indebted to Otto for all sorts of things, not the least for his eagle eye. When the materials were ensconced in the library, the Penn community offered its thanks to Miss Anderson with a performance in her honor of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony by student ensembles conducted by Eugene Naumer. Miss Anderson attended, and with a demeanor that brought back to me reverberations of my first encounter with her, she thanked the performers publicly, offering, the, offering them the warmest encouragement, along with wonderfully practical advice about how they could always continue to grow as musicians. Now we've had these, material for about four, these materials for about 40 years. They have been put to good use. Alan Kyler's definitive biography of Miss Anderson is, to use his own words, the product of an ongoing seven-year-long partnership with the staff of the university libraries. Any scholar who is concerned with the impact of Miss Anderson's career, whether from the perspective of its musical significance or its broader historical ramifications, needs to work with this collection. Adjacent to the Otto E. Uh, Albrecht Music Library on the fourth floor of Van Pelt is the Marian Anderson Music Study Center, where students of music come into comfortable proximity with the basic research tools of the discipline. Just outside the door of this room are display cases devoted to rotating exhibitions from the Anderson papers. If you're there at the right time, you can see groups of public school students from West Philadelphia taking in these exhibitions with excitement and pride and emotion. This brings us to our symposium today. Eight distinguished scholars are drawn together to focus anew and from new methodological perspectives on various uh, facets of the American musical experience, particularly the Afro-American musical experience. How often these subjects arise from one aspect or another of Marian Anderson's career is yet another tribute to the magnitude of her legacy. The day includes papers, an exhibit, a pre-concert interview, and a recital. I invite you to enjoy all of them. I invite you also, as you listen, to keep in mind the majestic persona that stands behind this legacy. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Glenda Goodman. I'm an assistant professor of music here at the University of Pennsylvania, and I have the pleasure of chairing our morning panel, which is very humanely divided into two portions. Um, thank you for whoever had that brilliant <laughs> idea. Um, and without any further ado, I will introduce our first speaker. So we'll have a speaker, then Q&A, speaker Q&A. Um, and our first speaker is Professor Naomi Andre. Um, she's an associate professor in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies, as well as Women's Studies um, at the University of Michigan, where she also serves as the associate director of faculty at the Residential College. She is the author of two books, um, the first entitled Black Opera, 
power, uh, I'm sorry, the first in, uh, historically, um, clearly not the first in my piece of paper here, um, is <laughs> voicing gender, Castrati, Travesti, and the second woman in early 19th century Italian opera, which came out in 2006. And her second book is Black, uh, Black Opera, History, Power, Engagement from, from just this year. And she's also the co-editor of Blackness in Opera. Today, she's going to be speaking with us about In Between Voices, a legacy uh, Marian Anderson left black singers on the opera stage. Please welcome Professor Andre. I'm not the most technologically savvy, so it's lovely to see that just magically appear. Thank you, <laughs> whoever did that. Thank you so much for this warm, work, well, warm welcome. And it's just a joy to be here and to see this symposium put together. Thank you to the organizers and for making it happen and for making us feel really welcomed as presenters. Marian Anderson's position in the world of opera is pivotal in the way she brought attention to black singers in opera through her historic debut at the Metropolitan Opera in 1955. Yet as many know, this was not her first or last accomplishment. Besides a successful tour of Europe in the early 30s, 1930s, she made a worldwide news in 1939 when she sang on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and she became an iconic figure of the civil rights movement. She sang for two presidential inaugurations, Eisenhower in 57 and Kennedy in 1961, and performed in the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, where Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream speech. Despite the private nature of her personality, Anderson's place in American culture intersected with the exhibition of the public in multiple ways. She occupied a position in between art and politics, opera and spirituals, concert singer and artistic ambassador. Anderson's career also holds a special place in the legendary black singers who came before her, including Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield, Ciceretta Jones, M Marie Selica, Flora Batson, all born in the 19th century, and the generations who have enjoyed operatic careers since, including Leontine Price, Shirley Verrett, Grace Bumbry, Florence Quivar, Denise Graves, Angel Blue, just to name a few. An underexplored legacy of Marian Anderson is the way an in-betweenness is embodied in so many aspects of her voice, career, and place in society. Sometimes it is found in the difficulty of putting black operatic voices into a neat category, such as the singers who move between standard repertory roles, including those who whose voices are called Zwischenfach, and I'll discuss more about that term later. Sometimes the in-betweenness is presented in the uncanny backgrounds of singers. And here, such as a school teacher from the Detroit public school system, my colleague George Shirley, professor emeritus of voice at the University of Michigan, an incredible opera singer who was given the presidential award by Obama in 2016. A violent youth sentenced to a juvenile detention facility. This is Ryan Speedo Green. Um, and his biography is available where you can read more about this. And a California beauty queen, Angel Blue, who made her Met debut this past um, season. Or the football player, Morris Robinson. And I just couldn't resist putting up some of these pictures because it really illustrates these interesting different um, positions. So you've got the first one, he was a linebacker for the Citadel uh, when he uh, played in Division I football. The uh, middle picture I just found on Facebook, and again, I'm not savvy with technology, so this was a fun one, where he um, he's uh, presented there in what's becoming a signature role for him, the Grand Inquisitor in Verdi's Don Carlo, and I just think he looks very, very cool with those glasses. <laughs> And then there's a picture of um, him, and I had the great pleasure of meeting him when he um, sang Porgy at the Porgy and Best performance um, at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor this past February when we were debuting the critical score. And he's just got this incredibly warm, wonderful uh, personality. So I just, I had to, to, to 
show us a few of those pictures. So these people who've had, you know, from school teacher to beauty queen to uh, juvenile detention facility to football player, before finding their place on the opera stage, from the past up through today, there is no standard way to be a black opera singer. The in-between characterization that was embedded in Anderson's career frequently remains a defining element for black opera singers today. This paper is organized into two sections that look into Marian Anderson's career in traditional and new ways. First, I will spend a little time on her historic Metropolitan Opera debut by delving into the actual role and thinking about what it meant for her to sing Ulrika from Verdi's 1859 opera Umbalo and Mascara. Second, I will explore this construction of Anderson and the in-between as a way to theorize her voice and her presence through various lenses of a third space, a double consciousness, and the conceit of the Zwischenfach for voices that defy easy categorization. African-American singer Marian Anderson became an important figurehead for black participation in opera in the United States and beyond. She was at the center of the highly publicized concert on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1939, when the Daughters of the American Revolution denied her the right to sing in the Constitution Hall, and First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt stepped in to voice her support of Anderson as an important classical American opera or singer. Today, many people know that Anderson broke the color barrier at the uh, at Metropolitan Opera in 1955 when she sang the character of Ulrika from Balu and Mascara by Verdi. This was an important symbolic move, for it ushered in a new era of having black singers perform at the Met, as well as other leading houses around the world. Let's spend a little time digging into the situation a little bit more, uh, more deeply and further think about how the details of this important debut can be interpreted. Marian Anderson had a career that primarily took place on the concert stage, in churches, and celebrated concert halls on the step of the Lincoln Memorial. Generally, she performed classical art song, for example, leader songs in French, Italian, and English. Her emphasis was in a non-operatic repertory, except for the arias and numbers excerpted from opera in her concert recitals. Her legacy is defined as having broken the barrier in opera, yet her actual experience in opera was quite limited. Her most famous operatic role, the only one that she sang in a major operatic venue, deserves closer inspection. The choice of Verdi's Ulrika for Anderson seems to be an uncanny fit for her experience and presence in opera. Ulrika is a major character, but unlike most major characters in an opera, her presence is quite limited. In fact, she's limited to only one scene in the second half of Act One, Act One, Scene Two. Given the segregation, oh, and these are just some beautiful pictures from that historic debut in January of 1955. Given the segregation of the opera stage and her resulting limited experience in opera, this opera allowed Anderson to dominate the stage when she appeared, but to also appear only once in the opera. While she was not entirely in the vocal prime of her career when she made this auspicious step in opera, she was born in 1897, so she was 57 years old when she made this debut, her performance was momentous and groundbreaking. The role was also a striking emblem for her debut at the Met. The character of Ulrika is a fortune teller, and depending upon the version of the opera followed, her role is specified as being a Negro fortune teller in the Boston setting at the end of the 17th century. The original setting of the opera had been in Sweden around the court of Gustavos III. And just a little sort of note of clarification, the issue of Verdi working with and despite the censors of his time is a rich area of Verdi scholarship. And the case of his writing the opera Umbalo and Mascara is perhaps the most difficulty he had in his career. The opera was originally intended for the Teatro San Carlo in Naples, but ended up being moved to the Te Teatro Apollo in Rome, due to troubles with the Neapolitan censors, who were notoriously difficult. One of the difficulties was the setting of the opera in Sweden and the situation of regicide when King Gustavos III is assassinated on stage. In, in Italy, where you have had you know, all these outside France and um, Austria and foreign presence in Italy, and during the Risorgimento, it's, you don't want regicide on, on the stage. In fact, maybe nobody wants that. 
<laughs> this changed, um, so instead of Sweden, this was changed to a setting in the United States with the fictitious Ricardo, the Count of Warwick, and the governor of Boston. In the Swedish setting, Ulrika's racial identity is not indicated, and she is called Mademoiselle Arvidsson. In this Boston setting, the character of Renato, Captain Ankerstrom in the Swedish setting, and I don't know how many of you have had sort of listened to the different versions, usually it's the Boston setting that's performed, but there are recordings that use Gustavo and Ankerstrom in the, um, in the text. Though there are different meaning, oh, Ankerstrom, he's the secretary to the governor, also has an ethnic characterization, as he is referred to as a Creole. Now, as a side note, there, though there are different meanings for the term Creole, a basic use for the word is this colonial setting, in the colonial setting for children born in the colonies. This can be children of mixed parentage from the colonies and the New World, or children born of colonial parents in the New World. Renato being a Creole is not necessarily an indication of his racial difference. In any case, Ulrika is a character who is set apart from the others in the opera. She appears only once and is marked as someone different from the others. In both versions, Swedish and the Boston one, her dwelling is off from the main action of the opera. She is somebody who can communicate with the supernatural as a fortune teller, and her music is exoticized through the use of tritones, low, rumbling woodwood timbres, and an invoked invocation she has to the Rey del Abisso, the king of the abyss of the underworld. For the first black voice featured on the Met Opera stage, Anderson fulfilled and mirrored the role of a foreign character invited as a featured presence to peer into an alternative plane of reality and predict a new future. Though these stereotypes are not negative in the sense of having a direct minstrel legacy, they do re reinforce her character as having an exotic heritage and position her as an outsider status, both in terms of ethnicity and race, as well as the geographic location on the outskirts of the town and the royal court, where most of the main action of the opera takes place. Anderson's integration in opera was complete as to her presence on the Metropolitan Opera stage. The role of Ulrika is important to the plot, but it is a small major role, or maybe a major small role, depending upon how you see her positions on the margins of the primary landscapes regarding the principal narrative and the geography of the opera. I am interested in the status of the in-between, a way to conceptualize how hybrid and syncretic elements come together. The bigger question is how do we talk about two different sources coming together, especially when there are inequalities involved regarding power, oppression, and resistance, how do we think of these things? Cultural theorist Homi Baba has a construction of the in-between hybridity and mimicry that are helpful aids for thinking about colonial influences and in post-colonial theory. But these are not my focus in this situation around Marian Anderson and her legacy in opera. Scholarly constructions of the in-between look to two general formation. First is a model where two things come together and they retain elements of both parts. This could be diagrammed as A plus B, where you have A, B, and both the two original elements are clearly um, legible in the result. The second formation is where two things come together and they create a new, a third, where this, for the simplistic diagram, A plus B equals something new, C. This is not the first time in my work that I have brought together two disparate things and theorized about how they fit together. In Voicing Gender, my book about Primo Cento, early 19th uh, century Italian opera and gender, I used the same idea about how masculinity and femininity were both embedded in the sound of the castrato voice. During that time in Italy, many things were intertwined in terms with how character type and vocal type were embodied in the singer. A castrato could sing the male heroic lead, and up through the end of the 18th century, this was the preferred vocal casting. Occasionally, primarily in Rome, where there were edicts against women singing on the stage, the young castrati would sing as the female characters in addition to the heroic male characters. In the 18th century, when a castrato could not be found, a woman was the next best choice. Of course, a woman's voice was also the best choice for a female character. My point in discussing this previous project is to bring into relief the issues of how the audience comes into play with what we know about the past and reception of singers on stage. 
With the castrati, it was an issue of how gender was tied up in embodiment and sound. The aesthetics for what sounded heroic and masculine, as well as what was considered feminine, were in transition at the end of the 18th century and into the first half of the 19th century. A period ear for what was seen and what was heard was shifting gears. It is not as though people were fooled by women singing on stage as male characters. Audiences knew and were titillated by what they saw, women in pants, women's legs, and women embodying the voice of authority. The space of voiced gender, highly flexible treble timbred voices embodying the masculine hero in the 18th and early 19th centuries is the space of agreed upon desire. The audience agrees upon simultaneous ways to hear and see gender. When Marian Anderson symbolically broke the color barrier for mainstream opera houses to employ black singers, the representation of opera moved into a new racial space. Bodies became racially marked as bo black bodies appeared on stage in roles that were indicated or assumed to be white. As my colleague, Dr. Kira Thurman, has shown in her work, um, when, uh, in her work, and especially dramatically in the article about Die Schwarze Venus, when Grace Bunbury sang as the first black singer at Bayreuth in the 1961 production of Tannhäuser, Bunbury's race was not not seen. It was greatly noticed, as it should have been for its historic importance. And themes around race and ethnicity resonated on many different levels. Marian Anderson took the first step in a long journey that we are still taking. Black bodies and voices are not normalized on the opera stage, even today. And I add that other people of color, Asian, Latinx, Native American, are still somewhat exotic when enter, encountered on the opera stage. Such voices are not the norm. My theorizing around a space for black bodies and voices on the opera stage is in progress, and sadly, I'm running out of time now. I am currently pursuing two additional directions for this project. The first is the possibility of filtering Du Bois's construction of a double consciousness from his um, work, The Souls of Black Folk, from 1903. So it's double consciousness to an audience reception of Anderson's voice and subsequent black bodies and voices in opera. Though frequently described as an internal conflict of, quote, seeing oneself through the eyes of other, of others, uh, one of Du Bois's definitions of double consciousness. I would like to harness this dual vision into a way of presenting a multivocal narrative of how a black presence in opera creates simultaneous conversations and meanings. The second direction I am not able to flesh out here fully, but to just introduce, is the idea of the Zwischenfach, the vocal space of the in-between. As singers and teachers know, the German Fach system is not without its troubles. It is a system that tries to categorize singers' voices in a way that is intended to help consider the repertoire a singer should focus on based on the vocal range, timbre, weight, and comfortable tessitura. Though some voices come in later than others in terms of how they flesh out, and voices can mature and somewhat change within the span of a career, the Fach system provides a helpful general guide. The Zwischenfach is an in-between category that both upholds and breaks down this Fach system. It's a, in a, a system of categories, it's the category that says this is the in-between. Many black singers, particularly women, have voices that seem to defy easy categorization. Grace Bunbury and Shirley Verrett are good examples of singers that have been called Zwischenfach, as they have voices that were able to shine and soar up high, as well as to have rich middle registers and really rich lower registers. So they couldn't easily be called sopranos or mezzo-sopranos throughout their career. Other black singers, Leontine Price and Florence Quivar, might not have been given the Zwischenfach label, but their voices have a richness and weight that allowed each of them to sing a wide range of roles that were not always associated together. They each sang varied repertoire, yet overlap in both singing the title role of Bizet's Carmen and Jocasta in Stravinsky's Oedipus Rex. And Maybe in discussions we can talk more about this as I've been looking at the different roles they sang, um, but I don't have time to do that in this official uh, moment. 
Had Marian Anderson been given, had the opportunity to enjoy a full length career in opera, on the opera stage, I suspect that her voice would have moved outside of easy categorization, just from listening to it and hearing it over the recordings we have. The construction of the in-between that I'm exploring in relationship to Marian Anderson's legacy is still in the early stages. Though through a jumping off point with a double consciousness in audience reception and the blurring of categories through the conceit of the Zwischenfach, I hope to extend our understanding of how Marian Anderson's presence is still very relevant for us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. I have not yet met um, the composer, Dr. Nkuru Okoye, but I know about her Harriet Tubman and her, she has a Cinderella, I think, and some other a response to the Trayvon Martin. She's a really important Nigerian-American composer, um, and I think she currently, I, I know, she currently has a project with, for the Houston Grand Opera. So it's exciting to hear how she is somebody who is actually writing about women's voices and men's voices, but using a lot of black topics and how do you vocalize and set this. I think we have the right people in the room, especially with Nina, Dr. Eidsheim here, as we think about what is at stake when we talk about black voices, black operatic voices. On one hand, we don't, I think, or at least I don't wanna go to an essentialized position that black voices can do these magical things, that they're so velvety, and, and these are deep and in, incredibly intensely powerful, which I've had people say to me, oh, those black women voices, there's just something really incredible about them. And I'm like, yeah, okay, and now, you know, step away, stalker. Or so, you know, it, there was always a weirdness about that. But is there, so that's on one far side. On the other side though, it seems, I'm noticing that it's very hard using a system that's been used for operatic voices and that works for many people singing opera of many different nationalities, the Fox system, who gets to sing what? And while there are always people of all different races and a lot of white singers who don't easily fit into the category, but when you have such a small number of black singers and so many of them don't fit into these categories, this idea of the in-between seemed to work really well. And then with the double voiced or double consciousness element. So I'm thinking about these things out loud and this is the first time I'm presenting them. So I appreciate this feedback. I hope that... Thanks. Kira, Dr. Uh, Thurman. Oh, sorry. <laughs> And fulfilling this sort of exotic, right. magical Negro right. space. Right. 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 So, yeah, so I was sort of thinking about that. And then, yeah. and then I think um, my other sort of comment, which is developing as I say it out loud, is um, that there are, of course, opera singers performing with um, opera companies before Mary Anderson breaks the barrier at right. IAT. But right. this is taking place in Europe. So, with Florence Cole Calvert, uh, Lillian yeah. Bonke were yes. performing in Nice in France and in Italy. I'm just curious, like, how do we, how do we sort of deal with that sort of pre-history before Marian Anderson? And 
maybe put it in conversation with Mary. Absolutely. I think right now, when you think who broke the color barrier, it's Marian Anderson. And there was something when the Metropolitan Opera does something like this, particularly with African American singers, sort of recognizing its own people. That's important. And yet, as recent scholarship is discovering, and it's really exciting, there is a really rich legacy, almost a shadow culture, as I've called it, of opera sort of black presence as composers, as singers, as all black opera companies. The Theodore Drury Company in the very beginning of the 20th century. The um, National Negro Opera Company with um, Mary Caldwell Dawson. So we have these cases of blackness and opera before. The space that Europe provides is very interesting, and we know it for jazz and how that, you know, there was this acceptance of jazz in Europe that was a very welcoming presence for black singers. We also know that as American singers, white singers, were making their career, even in the 70s and 80s. I remember hearing about this when I was coming up. I had, you know, like a two-second idea that maybe I wanted to become a singer, that a lot of American singers would go and prove themselves in houses in Europe. And it was thought that smaller houses in Germany, especially, was a good place to learn roles and sing through different works. The fact that it was a space for black singers, and we know it was, Anne Brown, the first Bess of Porgy and Bess, Lily Novante, these are singers who were able to sing and who actually would go and relocate their black singers there. And I think this um, history needs to, be, needs to be told, needs to come out there. And the work you're doing is particularly exciting. And I know that Dr. Oja has some incredible work looking at black singers in different places in Europe. So this is a history being written. I don't want to rewrite Marian Anderson out of the momentous role because she does have an incredibly important role. What that meant, sort of that shifting, almost a Rosa Parks moment where, okay, now all this energy is solidified and it gets attention and something's done. She feels to me in some ways like a Rosa Parks of the opera stage. But it's not to minimize the fact that there's lots of other stuff happening and we need to get those, those names out there. So yeah, excellent point. Oh dear, sorry, meaning, oh dear, where is it? There, sorry. Oh, by musicality, that's interesting. Early. Sure. I just barely had a chance to go into this, and it's great to get this feedback. So this idea of what happens when we're dealing with the situation of oppression, and particularly in ethnomusicology, we've seen cases, a, a great example I teach regularly is Paul Simon with his 1986 album, Graceland, and when he brings in Lady Smith Black Mambazo, particularly for the song Homeless, and how you've got sort of these two traditions, the it's a cathemia of um, the Zulu or male tradition with Lady Smith Black Mambazo, and they have sections of the song they sing on their own, but then they sing together. But we know that Paul Simon, and this is from 1986, during the height of apartheid in South Africa, there are certain power dynamics. He's the one who has the artistic decisions, the legal rights, you know, so that connection of forming, you know, a big Western and global in this new world of um, world music that, was this album was a big part of it. So we have this new sort of world music global hit with you know the Western Paul Simon, this wonderful songster coming out of New York, and Lady Smith Black Bambazo, who were super popular already in South Africa. What and so syncretism, hybridity, these things are how do we think about what the new thing that's created? I also think another 
another stream in this conversation is, what do we do when we have the, um, the Western, we have this Western black music historiography out there, and we think of black singers very welcomingly in blues, spirituals, church music, Motown, funk, in sort of a popular music and church vein, but we don't always think of them in a classical music, in what American music can be. And I think there's a double-voicedness or maybe a hybridity. If we begin to think of American music as having both of these strains in there, the tapestry, the landscape of American music has not really included how the stories have been told, this black classical or art music voice. Here we have people who can do, who are very involved with the vernacular and popular traditions. I don't want to use sort of high and low because those are problematic, but music that plays in different venues and for different functions. But what happens when we get these composers who are singing opera or singing, being, um, writing operas? What are the, what's the richness of experience that they can bring into what is now an American classical music? Our traditional narrative of American classical music tends to go start from Ives, the first you know white composer who was educated all in the U.S., and then it kind of moves to the experimentalist. And there's a New England school, but there are black composers writing symphonies and string quartets and operas at the same time that we haven't woven in there, and we're not looking at the to try to keep this metaphor going, the tapestry with our full you know color glasses. <laughs> we're looking at it in a much more two dimensional or sort of toned down set of colors. So it's a long answer to try to say, yes, what you're saying about these relationships of two things, and I'm trying to ferret them out and pull them together. But I think if we really consider what the legacy of Marian Anderson does on the opera scene, it changes how we have to think about what's happening in opera. Okay. So if you don't mind um, repeating the question, because oh. Oh, sorry, sure. <laughs> and women uh, also playing these heroic roles in the uh, Baroque period. And I'm wondering if it's not just about gender, but it, it might be about going beyond gender. Because when you think about the high voices in the earlier period, such as the high voices throughout history have always been associated with the angelic and with spirit. Higher the voice, the closer to God. Yeah. <laughs> So that, that it's okay for a woman to sing that role, and she, you know, if that's what we have, we have a role. It's just beyond gender in some way. And you spend, you know, with if, with Mary Anderson's voice, sometimes in tradition thought, okay, you're getting, it's, it's like, well, is it a woman or a man? It doesn't matter. It is the voice that you're hearing. You know, you're hearing something that's beyond the physical body. I so appreciate this question about gender. I'm trying to repeat the question for about gender and in and especially with um, Dr. James with your work with this time period in 18th century opera. So I know you are deeply engaged with these issues. I love this idea that maybe gender can be transcended through sound instead of being male, female, or something in between, or something that's both. And I'm you trying to use this precisely. I'm so glad that this is sort of working, this idea of, OK, what does it mean when we have one binary of black and white, or white is the default norm, and then we have sort of this other body who sings, who could sing white roles, you know, Susanna, the Countess. We love that. And but when you have somebody like Leontine Price singing Aida, there's a different sense of, and I, I had a talk about this last night at the Italian Opera um, Studies Center, where when you have the, the uh, racial body and the role intersect, there's like a different element. So when Ulrika, Marin Anderson singing, this fortune teller sort of looking into the, into the future, there's something, I see this, even though I wasn't there in 1955, but I see this now, thinking about it, re reconstructing it in pictures, listening to her voices, it feels like a very prophetic 
um, and otherworldly sort of sense that is happening. So I really appreciate that question. I think absolutely this idea of almost, I don't want to make something too disembodied and take it out of all material cultural context, but I think there's something to be said how there's this transcending that doesn't fit in the categories we have. So, I, and I'm repeating the question now to make sure I've heard it. So Marian Anderson from Philadelphia would sing concerts where there was opera arias as well as um, gospel or spirituals and art song. Was that, okay. I think a real rich area of research, and it sounds like it can happen right here in this building, is looking at what these concert programs were about. I have a colleague at the University of Michigan, James Cook, who's now chairing the history department. His early work was looking at P.T. Barnum and um, the Swedish Nightingale, Jenny Lind. Um, so he's not a musician, but looking at, he's got a current very large project due out in Norton in the next couple of years, looking at black performers in the United States. And through him, he had, he, we were working on a collaboration shortly, and there was, he had programs that Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield was singing. She was singing, you know, we know that she, another person who was here in Philadelphia, and it made me realize there is a very rich tradition here in Philadelphia, particularly for the 19th century, where the, sort of a large Quaker, the Friends community, and their relationship with the abolition movement. So Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield's Field, owner, um, they were on a plantation in the South, and then when the husband died, she was brought, the owner, and the, the wife, and Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield came here to Philadelphia. She was, became a freed, um, black person in the, you know, before the Civil War. She had voice lessons. And then during the Civil War and afterwards, she was singing in uh, concerts where Frederick Douglass was speaking. She was singing in sort of these early, during Reconstruction period, what we think of the Civil Rights Movement with Marian Anderson. It would be great to see those programs because we have programs that Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield was singing and how her voice could do so many things and yet she was frequently singing The Little I Saw. She wasn't doing the big show-off pieces. She was doing lullaby almost enforcing the domestic, sort of the voice of the, the mother, the mammy, sort of being there. I mean, it's just really interesting to read these programs. So the long um, answer is, I think looking at the repertory that was being sung can be read culturally, what was happening. I'd be really interested to see more about we, what Marian Anderson, sort of when she, sort of, because she seems to be, and there's so much more research and more I need to learn, such a careful presence in thinking about who she was and what she sang, how she organized a concert, sort of which song Songs and which arias, which leader, which chanson, what was on the program at the same time, I think is a really, will, will give us statements about not just, oh, I feel like singing these, these are good in my voice, but I'm trying to make a statement now. I mean, when I found out that she was at the I Have a Dream speech in 1963 with Martin Luther King, I'm like, oh my gosh, why don't we know about this more? Her voice was a voice of the nation. And it was singing not just for entertainment, but it was doing important cultural business. So this symposium is kicking off such a great, great thing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Nina Eidsheim. Um, She's a professor of musicology at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she also is the special assistant to the Dean of the School of Music. She's the author of two books, um, the first being Sensing Sound, Singing and Listening as Vibrational Practice, which was published by Duke University Press in 2015. And her second book is coming from Duke University Press in, um, next year, and it's entitled The Race of Sound, Listening, Timbre, and Vocality in African American Music. And she's also co-editing the Oxford Handbook of Vo Voice Studies. Um, today she'll be speaking with us about fa uh, phantom genealogy, sonic blackness, and the American operatic timbre. Please welcome Dr. Eichheim. Um, 
I want to add my thanks to Naomi's, to everybody who has organized this fantastic symposium. I know that so many people I don't even know the names of have been behind this, but especially I want to thank Liza, Ari, Jamuna, and of course the Kiss Lake Center and, um, and Penn University. So I want to start with a little caveat. Um, given that this room is filled with Marian Anderson experts, I should warn you that in this talk, uh, what, um, what I imagine will be most, unlike what I imagine will be mo uh, most presentations today, in my talk you will not learn some new or intriguing aspect of Anderson's work. Uh, my study of Anderson has focused on the ways in which we are entrained to listen, so my contribution will be from that angle. I believe uh, that how we listen to voice has affected not only Anderson as she broke the color barrier at the Metropolitan Opera, but also the um, the African-American opera singers who came after her. In fact, as a scholar of voice, through the study of singers like Anderson, I've come to understand that their voices do not exist in the public sphere outside of the ways in which they have been cast through listening. Thus, to more fully understand Anderson's art, we must reconsider how vocal timbre is used as a source of meaning making. Which dynamics are at play in listening to African-American vocal timbre? In Kimberly Crenshaw's formulation, for African-American opera singers, what are, quote, the multiple avenues through which racial and gender oppressions, and the quote, are expressed through vocal timbral assessment, or simply the ways in which they are listened to? Belief in the existence of timbral blackness has significantly influenced the trajectory of Anderson's and subsequent African-American singers' careers, as well as characterizations and vocal writing in original American opera. I suggest that this trajectory, which also played a role in how Anderson developed vocally, has proved difficult for subsequent singers to escape. Finally, listening to Anderson not only clarifies the ways in which listening is used as a tool to naturalize voice, it shows that listening can also be used to denaturalize racialized notions of vocal timbre. In studying uh, listening practices surrounding Anderson, I've come to understand that the traditional notions of vocal timbre is a, a construct. There is no unified or stable voice that we can point to. The consequence of this can be summarized into three um, intercalated uh, correctives that better capture what voice is and what we can actually identify when we identify voice. Voice is not singular, it is collective. Voice is not innate, it is cultural. Voice the source is not the singer, it is the listener. Um, right. Taking these correctives one at a time, we have first, voice is not singular, it is collective. The voice is not a distinct entity, but rather it is part of a continuous material field. The so-called physical individual voice then is part of a continuum, a concentration of energy that we interpret and define as a distinct voice. The voice is composed of a collection of bodily organs involved in the production of sound, the acoustical conditions within which sound is emitted and sensed, and the style and technique acquired through lifetimes of training, what Farah Jasmine Griffin calls cultural style. No single part of this collection of styles and techniques involves race essentially or entails the uniqueness of the speaker. It is rather a performance of cultural style. James Baldwin observes the collective performance of race thusly. Quote, I began to suspect that white people did not act as they did because they were white, but for some other reason. End of quote. Baldwin's insight is that whiteness is a particular performance of culture. The performance of whiteness is followed by the assumption that any such traits are either expressions or false performances of a person's essential nature. For example, this is, it is this, this deep-seated belief that is expressed in the observation that President Obama, quote, talks white, end of quote, and I'm quoting Ralph Nader here. In the absence of underlying assumptions regarding the performed sound of whiteness and which bodies have the right to perform such sonorities, there would be no reason to make such a point about Obama, for instance. Because the voice is not distinct or and separate, it possesses neither the capacity to signal innate and unmediated qualities, nor a stable uh, identity. Um, 
Uh, moreover, the voice is not unique, in part because it's not a static organ. It is not an isolated and distinct entity. Instead, it is shaped by the overall physical environment of the body, the, the nutrition to which it has access or of which it is deprived, and the fresh air it enjoys or harmful particle it inhales. It is the physical body and vocal apparatus that are trained and untrained each time a voice voices and that develop accordingly. Vocal tissue, mass, musculature, and ligaments renew and are entrained in the same way as the rest of our bodies. But because we often focus on the sound and assume that there is an unchanging relationship between the entity we believe to be a static, distinct human and the vocal sound we hear, we also assume that the voice is intrinsic and unchangeable. However, just as the body possesses different qualities or is able to carry out different activities, depending on how it is, has been nurtured and conditioned, so too is the voice an overall continuation and expression of the environment in which it participates. The second corrective is that voice is not innate, it is cultural. Vocal choices are based on the vocalizer's position within the collective rather than arising solely as individual expressions. Vocal communities share an invisible and often unconscious and inexpressible synchronicity of vocal movements and vocal performance, gravitationally attracted by the dynamic of the culture in which the vocalizer participates. This takes place, for example, through the uh, vocal body's movements, habituation of practice, proprio perception or self-monitoring, listening, and the specific practices adapted to an expressive of a given culture's ideology, cultures and ideologies ideal. Neither speaker nor singer uses the entire range of their voices, infinite timbral potentialities. In other wo words, the decisive factor in honing each voice's potentiality and developing expertise in vocal timbre is not individual preference, but collective pressure and affirmation. Given the multitude of timbral choices that are involved in learning how how to use the voice, voices tend to develop based on collective rather than singular preference. The process that determines which areas of vocal potential we attend to and therefore will be understood as innate is a social one. What we conceive of as a single voice then is a manifestation of a given culture's understanding of the vocalizers and his or her role within that culture. Vocal timbre is a manifestation of shared vocal practice. Um, and the third corrective then, which I already have up here, is that, as we've already begun to see, is that voice does not arise solely from the vocalizer. It creates just as much within the process of listening. And this means that voices are her um, the voices heard are ultimately identified, recognized, and named, named by listeners at large. In hearing a voice, one brings forth a series of assumptions about the nature of voice. Um, uh, so, uh, repertoire and casting practices. In this inscription, we witnessed what I think I'm sorry. Um, uh, okay, here we are. In contrast to applying um, these correctives by studying Anderson's performances, um, I feel. So I've been listening to how we have listened to Anderson, and uh, uh, while I have deciphered these kind of um, constructs from her, I, f I think that most of the ways that she's been listening to, listened to is not in this way, so I'm going to explain how she has been listened to. Uh, she has been listening listened to through this naturalized notion of voice. And as such, her story is emblematic of American opera has dealt with the idea of blackness. Sentiments about race have been written into the country's operatic uh, repertoire and casting practices. In this inscription, we witness what they call a phantom genealogy, the false association between uh, African-American singers and other vocal timbre and essential difference. This phantom genealogy has played a central role in the formation of American operatic repertoire and practices. And as I just mentioned, the voice of source is not the singer, but the listener. Earlier, often compromised performance contexts laid the foundation for listeners' association of particular bodies with certain repertoire and vocal timbre. I go through this in much greater depth in, my, in the book that was mentioned, but briefly here. First, sociologist John Cruz's work on how abolitionists listen to slave songs and his notion of ethno ethnosympathy help us to understand how provisional subjectivity was granted to slaves and what this meant about how they and subsequent African Americans were heard. Second, African American singers' performance opportunity of classical music took place within the same spaces and on the same program with minstrel repertoire, burlesque shows, and spirituals. 
those perceptions of classical performances by African Americans became in inextricably linked to these genres. Third, two key American operas from the early 20th century, Four Saints in Three Acts and Porgy and Bess, formally reenacted prevalent white views of African American identity and performance skills and served to bolster particular listening approaches. Together, these types of listening created associations around voices that are not necessarily present sonically or technically. So Cruz then described um, abolitionists um, listening to slave songs as a new mode of hearing, possibly only under the assumption that slaves possessed an in, uh, inner life. Term, uh, Cruz terms this mode of reception, um, ethnosympathy, a humanistic uh, pursuit of classifiable subjects. Uh, it functions as a vehicle through which sympathetic whites, particularly abolitionists, could further imagine slaves as culturally expressive subject. And here the quote, cultural uh, authenticity Cruz writes, was a key to subject authenticity. In other words, evidence that slaves were not only capable of worship, but also of a cultural exchange, was taken as proof that they possessed agency and emotion, that they were human subjects, not mechanisms or animals. Hearing enslaved voices with ethnosympathetic ears allowed listeners to discover underlying authenticity of subjects through their cultural practices. A perception arguably carried over into con conceptions of African Americans singing classical music. It is possible that ethnosympathy underlies the prevailing preference among audiences for spirituals paired with classical repertoire, as well as discourse that attributes the emotional capital present in an African American singer's interpretations of classical music to a natural aptitude for spirituals. In the changing perception of the slave voice from noisy and incomprehensible to lamenting and expressive, voices become metonyms of skin and hair, often referred to by placeholder terms indicating the exceptional um, emotional expressivity. When fiscally singers introduced spirituals to the concert circuit in the 1870s, the performance vocal presentations were praised as plaintive and touching, thrilling with their weight of sorrow and having an indescribable pathos. An anonymous reviewer described the voice as being so full of character <clears throat> um, and so full of color and so little originality is met with these days that their strangeness is agreeable. As Julia uh, uh, Chibovsky observes, this language echoes that of abolitionists, especially that of Harriet Beecher Stover, um, who sponsored uh, many of Elizabeth Taylor Greenfield's oops, um, and uh, British appearances. Together with Matilda Cesaretta Jones, Greenfield was among the first African-American singers to perform classical repertoire for large interracial audiences, winning national and international acclaim. Greenfield's reception in America and Britain would influence that of Fisk Jubilee singers. For her British listeners, Greenfield embodied American slave culture. Um, audiences were charmed by her perceived musical humanities and um, Anglo-European musical achievement. A reviewer of Jones's Echo, both abolitionist accounts of slaves' voices and a reviewer sketches of Fisk Jubilee singers. In the Washington Post's um, 1903 consideration of uh, the Negro voice, the author drew associations between sentiments and language resonating with earlier descriptions of slaves. African Americans, such as Greenfield and Jones, who tried their luck as concert singers and the later Fisk Jubilee singers. In the Post's account, uh, Jones's voice is absolutely unique and indescribable with a remarkable quality that would be lessened by cultivation. <clears throat> As reviewers frequently highlighted Gr Greenfield's and Jones's bodies, opera scholars have noted the visual appearance of African-American singers in terms of casting. Rosalind uh, Story investigates the ambiguous feelings expressed by many African-American singers toward George Jershwin's black cast, only Porgy and Bess, and his racial uh, typecasting. Lisa Garb Barg <laughs> describes how the first casting of Virgil Thompson's Four Saints in Three Acts relied on preconceptions that tended to exoticize African American performers. And third, as Naomi Andrew has noted, the black operatic protagonist as anti hero can be found from Otello to Johnny and Porgy. Thus, ethnosympathy, connections to burlesque minstrel and spiritual repertoire, and visual casting comprised a collective and listening practice within which Anderson was heard. For example, Winston Sheehan's reception of Anderson's performance of Spiritual in Salzburg is not unusual um, and echoes London's critics' sentiments. Um, in the last groups, um, she sang Spiritual, they crucified my Lord, and um, 
um, and they um, never said a mumbling word. Hardly anybody in the audience understood English well enough to follow what she was saying, yet the immense sorrow of something more than the sorrow of a single person that weighted her tones and lay over her dusky, angular face was enough. At the end of this spiritual, there was no applause at all, um, a silence instinctive, natural, and intense, so that you could, were afraid to breathe. What Anderson had done was something outside the limit of classical or romantic music. She frightened us with the conception in musical terms, of course, but outside of normal limits of mighty suffering. This review repeats the collective sorrow uh, that the reviewers had also described in Jones's voice. She and indeed evokes the same sentiment for which abolition reached as for the first time they grasped the humanity and subjectivity of slaves. Even in his favorable review insists on the spiritual uh, as the root of African-American expressivity. In contrast, Anderson's attitude towards repertoire was open and exploratory. Her repertoire encompassed all of the major arias suitable for her fach, including some for soprano. She went on to develop programs of Finnish, fin uh, French, German, Italian, Norwegian, Spanish, and Swedish art and folk songs, always ensuring sh that she would sing something by a national composer on her concerts throughout Europe. When she was invited to give a recital at the White House, she was asked to sing only spirituals, but characteristically, she insisted on including a few pieces by Franz Schubert. Although she was arguably one of the most gifted century, singers of the century, we heard this quote earlier today uh, um, by Toscanini. He said, what I heard today, um, one is privileged to hear only one in a hundred years. In the public's mind, Anderson's er artistic career was often overshadowed by her assigned role as a, quote, tattered uh, social symbol. That came a little bit early. As her biographer, Alan Kyler, noted, in her 1939 appearance at the Lincoln Memorial Center on Easter morning, where she sang over 75, for over 75,000 people, um, including President and Eleanor Roosevelt, this became an iconic moment for the civil rights movement. But her symbolic role in the movement ran counter to her own intention to be a classical musician. It is likely that listeners who have also associated blackness with singers such as Greenfield and Jones, with whom Anderson's lifespan overlapped by 21 and 28 years, respectively, seen the racialized casting of African-American singers in Four Saints and heard Anderson within the context of spirituals were unable to shake such association when Anderson was finally hired by the most prominent opera company in the United States. In casting her as a gypsy pro um, sorceress, and you already saw this image earlier, the Metropolitan uh, Opera arguably intensified and further pro um, propagated this association. Considering the long associative chain invoked when African-American singers are heard primarily in terms of race rather than of style and technique, what did, did this pivotal moment affect for Anderson and subsequent African-American singers? So I suggest that the aftermath of Anderson's meth debut, which the slide came up early here, an event that was positioned as, um, as you can see, uh, an open opening a door by the New York Times, a pivot point for African-American classical singers, resembles the phenomenon of a painful phantom limb, which, because it doesn't exist, is difficult to cure. And I can't wait to hear your, you're going to talk more about this uh, premiere, I imagine, today, Carol. Because of the politics of pervasive racism under which opera was desegregated, the parents of the first African-American female performer of the Metropolitan Opera I believe, failed to disrupt the phantom genealogy. The phantom limb aches long after the actual limb is gone because the limb is no longer connected to the body. Traditional treatments cannot be applied. With Anderson's debut, the segregated state of major American opera stages were cut off like an amputated limb. It might seem then that the problem of inequality had been dealt with like a body freed from infection with the severing of a limb. But as with the phantom limb, it has been difficult to pinpoint and treat the persistent pain of the marker of difference. Deep-seated assumptions about difference that listeners projected onto African-American voices have affected the way subsequent voices, even those lauded by metropolitan opera audiences, are heard. African-American singers and they audi their audiences are still affected by the impact of this phantom limb, like a veneer-like se desegregation. Even singers like Brian uh, Speed or Green who we also saw a picture of earlier today, the 2001 Metropolitan Opera competition winner, have experienced repeated typecasting, for example, through requests to sing Old Man River. 
Up to this point, I made the case that while the desegregated opera stage is seemingly a phenomenon of the past, Anderson and subsequent African-American singers are still heard through notions of difference. This is why while the limb of segregation has been cut off, opera stages are still temporally divided through listening, thus the phantom pain persists. To cure phantom pain in an amputated arm, a mirror may allow the amputee to come to grips with the limb's absence. To cure the pain of being reduced to the sum of a phantom genealogy constructed within the racist history, we must also hold up a mirror to what requires repair, and that is listening. But if listening, which I've diagnosed as a naturalizing tool, uh, is already so fraught, how can it also be used to denaturalize voice? I have learned that we can denaturalize the voice by working through one of the erroneous assumptions commonly held about it, that through the listening identification process, we can name and we can know a voice. I call this the res a response to the acousmatic question. While the term acousmatic is typically used when um, the connection between the source and the sound is severed, when it comes to voice, we ask and we respond to the acousmatic question, not only when we're separated from the source, but also while uh, um, but also, also all the time, who is this? Who is this is a question we also ask in a situation like now when I'm speaking right in front of you. Who is this? A foreign woman? I have formulated the following steps in relation to the ways in which the acousmatic question is approached and answered. And there are some resonances, or many resonances, I think, with your paper, Naomi. I had no idea. Um, but here, um, <laughs> I think we're kind of, <laughs> I am approaching it from listening, though, not from like what the voice actually is. So here, um, let's see, uh, okay, from, to the left of the equals. Um, so the, um, I formulated the following steps in relation to the ways in which the acousmatic question is approached and answered, located to the left of the equal sign, and the ways in which the answer is assembled to the right of the equal sign. So, S equals one, uh, plus zero. Formula A describes solipsistic listening, where the listener is um, limited to naming herself as a phenomenon in the world. While we, uh, we, while we might assume that the object refers to someone other than oneself, in this response to the acousmatic question, the answer always points to the listener. The zero is object, an imaginary limited other, purely defined by the listener's available a priori. The other is also defined by its perceived difference from the subject. So formula B then, describes a situation in which the singer, position one, and listener, position two, are catapulted into a third category, realizing that neither is the subject and neither is object. When able to sense the stylistic and technical aspect of the voice, the listener must take in the voice of the other as subject. At the same time, the listener recognizes that this taking in is also a subject position. The existence of two subjects creates the third position, the infinity of all positions, which leads us to the ratio of the self and to the recognition of you of all possibilities and multiplicities. And this leads us to the third uh, formula. From the perspective of formula C, we consider no one position more important than any other. Indeed, we understand any particular position as the result of a choice based on many possibilities. In the complex of um, events that is singing and in the potentiality of styles and techniques, framing and naming point only to these sets of particularities, and in doing so, they point equally to all others. And I don't know if this is something akin to uh, Andre's uh, theorizing of the in-between or vision for I was like looking crazily through my paper as you were <laughs> talking <laughs> because I was, I'm trying to find the points of connections and divergences. So let's flesh out these uh, formulas by considering Anderson and her predecessor Greenfield. Um, according to formula A, listening stance A, as the listener, my listening is contained within the limits of my own symbolic world. I can only hear Anderson through the images I have already formed about women, African Americans, Anderson as an icon, and so on. In other words, listeners are tasked with comparing what they hear with pre-formulated sets of assumptions. Within this dynamic, a given voice is heard either as the essence of an a priori or not aligned with that a priori, like Obama sounds white, for instance. He's supposed to sound like one thing, but he sounds like another. For example, Anderson was explicit in inserting her identity as an artist rather than a political activist, yet she was repeatedly framed and heard through a particular interpretive lens as an African-American singer in the context of the civil rights movement. 
Moreover, while she understood her own artistry within the context of, operatic, um, of the operatic vocal tradition, she was also often viewed as a natural singer within the genealogy of African-American music. This type of listening does not grant the singer Anderson agency. The singer simply fulfills or does not fulfill the listeners a priori, which have been collected as a result of a certain set of circumstances. Um, uh, according to formula B, listening sense B, um, the listener's listening is expanded to release his or her symbolic referential frame, acknowledging that voices are the re result of style, technique, and conditions. Within this approach, the Toronto Globe in 1852 not only rhapsodized about the amazing power of Greenfield's voice, the flexibility and the ease of execution, but also reported that the higher passages were given with clearness and fullness, indicating a soprano of great power. This latter description <clears throat> describes one that is recognized, uh, one that does recognize the singer's style and technique, the listener's ability to experience the singers as separate from him, her, or themselves. A person, uh, as a person with agency who executes style and technique, releases the singer from definition by the li listener. The singer is granted an independent existence and agency. For example, Greenfield and Anderson become singers worthy of their place in America's musical history because of their, their style and technique. Their singing are exquisitely executed. The voice is not 50% I and not 50% you. Instead, it exists within an unrepeatable constellation of circumstances. Uh, co uh, oops. Um, yeah. Considering the same example from the opposite point of view, we cannot access the totality of the figure Greenfield or Anderson through any particular reading, but the partial understanding may be accessed through attention to momentary techniques. When listening from this position, we don't hear the complete Anderson or Anderson's essence, but rather the specific sound of a person in one moment in time who is bending notes while allowing sound to cross her throat at different points in her training and in time and even with a cold. So we hear that person as a, um, a singing person. <laughs> this recognition would redeem her presence. Anderson performing a particular style and technique would return it to the foreground of our attention. So the third formula C then expresses the idea that if a voice may be understood to hold two positions involving style and technique, it can also in hold an infinite number of other positions. When the collection of styles and techniques is distinguishable through one name, it may also be distinguishable th both through another name and another and another and yet another. Given this infinity of possibilities, any assumption about one distinction's correctness are already erased. According to this formula, we can recognize Anderson's vocal style and technique, and this can be heard, her, these can be heard as patterns that we already know by names such as spiritual singer, leader singer, opera singer, Philadelphian, and, so, and, 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 and infinity. However, the names we give to those patterns are not Anderson, they're just the names of patterns and does not describe her essence then. Moreover, within the form, third formula, the concept of me as a separate identity and the recognition that there is something that is not me coexists. The effect is something that is not me and not you yet includes both of us, don't know if this is your A plus B equals C, each of us is only one formulation of infinite possibilities. In this point then, there is no way of separating me from you without severing the relationship. Because each voice has infinite potential, any given materialization holds no more power than the infinite number of other possibilities. In other words, Anderson's instrumentalization of certain sets of styles and techniques does not define her any more than do any of the other existing infinite numbers of styles and techniques. It only points to infinity. That said, my goal is not simply to grasp people's complexities, uh, adding more and more identities to those we have already perceived and named, and instead of an overarching most correct identity, quote unquote, privileging, for example, race and gender over other aspects, studying Anderson suggests a non-hierarchical relationship. Uh, becoming a stranger among sounds is how Josh Kuhn describes this. We become strangers among sounds when we remove the hierarchy, the idea that one element is more important or relevant than another. By retaining interconnectedness, we create a logical conjunction. The logical conjunction uh, is the statement that A and B is true if A and B are both true, otherwise it is false, producing a non-referential relationship among rather than between. <laughs> that is, two things share a relationship without one of them determining the relationship. 
all of these name, namings are connected and related, but this relationship of each expression of it isn't a linear one of cause and effect, time and space, before and after. It's a relationship that is manifest through the, relation, through the, the realization of the fact of the relationship. In this formulation, we may expand our formula to acknowledge the conjunction of the formula A and B. Within this conjunction, we see that um, um, formulas A and B are not in opposition to each other. Instead, the conjunction spells out that each um, um, one is zero is one plus zero, and each zero is zero plus one. It includes any possible combinations of ones and zeros. Each point contains the binary. Moreover, through the conjunction, we can move to formula C, where no single point overrides another. Because we're translating from a linear subject-object based discourse, the process of arriving at the response is expressed one plus one plus one infinity. However, this does not mean that we're only talking about the infinite collection of namings and identities. This is a foreigner, a woman, a colleague, a daughter, a scholar, a runner, a singer, etc., etc. But that discourse, writing as Zadie Smith has lamented, is always partial in its perspective, fumbling in this inadequate way towards grasping an inexpressible whole. While we might be reliant on such methods and partial perspectives, I feel encouraged when witnessing the work carried out in these areas by singers such as Anderson. She shows us that the acousmatic question's impetus is counterintuitive. We can't answer it. In the face of common sense, the key to the question does not lie in its ability to reproduce or to produce a reliable answer when asked. Anderson shows us that the key lies in disrupting the erroneous collective conception that voice and difference are essential, stable, and knowable, hence opening up space for enriching and complicating listeners' responses to that cosmetic question. It is by devising new listening heuristics we can attend to the phantom genealogy through which voices of Anderson and even contemporary singers such as Peter Green are timbrally fashioned. The acousmatic question's import, then, lies in the contradiction that it cannot fully be answered and thus must continually be pursued. It is in the totality of the chain of impossible to answer questions that we can hear Marian Anderson. Thank you. Oh. Thank you uh, so much for your presentation. You've given a lot for me to think about. Um, I was wondering, um, maybe this is like a cheesy way to begin. I'm going to riff off of Gayatri Spivak, you know, can the subaltern speak to ask, can the subaltern sing? Um, which is in some ways, I think, what you're, what you're getting at. I'm really intrigued by your line that two things can share a relationship without one of them determining the relationship. Um, you know, but I, I think I'm also a, a little sort of uh, unsure about it. I mean, just in terms of how it, does it account for, you know, all the sort of historical, cultural, political factors that go into the practice of listening. I was just wondering maybe if you had an example in mind that you find really effective for demonstrating perhaps um, how there can this, how this this kind of listening and singing can be non-hierarchical. If you if there's yeah, just for me to maybe grasp onto. A, a sort of maybe more simple, simple listener myself. Well, this is aspirational. I don't believe this <laughs> is necessarily taking place now. I, what I'm saying is that um, you know, by by Anderson grappling with all these different ways that people listen to her and define her, um, I think what she's and she, uh, she was insisting on certain things, but she also couldn't re um, uh, censor uh, everything that was ascribed to her. So. I'm, Mm. This aspiration is, uh, I think, I believe Anderson shows us this aspiration of being able to listen in this relationship that uh, where none is overriding the other, that we can hold these um, uh, different definitions uh, together at the same time. So when somebody is describing something to you or something to me, um, we can we need to go back to see why that is ascribed instead of resisting it to say no, that's not me. If somebody is saying um, um, this is an Asian woman, when they um, uh, talk about my voice, for instance, who is you? Who are you? <laughs> or who is this? This is a, the voice of an Asian woman. I can say that's not true. 
and I, and I can resist it. But if I if I think if I uh, am in this space with um, these different statements uh, sharing a space, I would have to uh, understand why the person believes that about my voice. And the person then also would have to be, go back and understand why they believe that about my voice too and why maybe it's more complicated. So I think when we're trying to hold these relationships together rather than rejecting them, um, it, uh, it just gives us basically a lot of homework, as what you were just saying now, and we'll have to see the, the roots of each of them. We'll have to look at this phantom genealogy because I think when we're just holding on to these positions and just trying to battle them out, um, um, we don't do the deep work that you're suggesting to see the historical context, to understand the historical context. Um, I know that scholars do this, of course, this is our life mission in, uh, for all of us in this room, but in our listening instances, I think often we, I, I, I count myself in, in, um, as one of them, like in the instance of meeting somebody, I hear you as a woman, I hear you as an American, I hear you as a professor, I hear you as a foreigner, you know, I, I, I immediately hear these things. So by holding all those together and saying, wow, they actually uh, rub up against each other, I'll, it forces me to have to go back into these, each of their, uh, their phantom genealogies. So, thank you, but it's pr purely aspirational. It's a heuristic that I, that I believe Anderson and other seniors uh, give us through their practice. I always enjoy your work and I, I'm always inspired by it. I'm, I wasn't gonna ask this question, but I think I'm going to be courageous and ask this. Um, and I, I'm tapping into my personal narrative in the study of voice. I wonder, it, do you, as a person who researches the voice, do you think referring to Marian Anderson with the vocal designation of contralto given the time period is sufficient. I say this because whenever I listen to um, her recordings and I think of how often African-American voices or voices um, that represent uh, people of African ancestry, um, they are often um, um, given the wrong vocal designation through formal study. I was told I was a mezzo because of my low speaking range. And I was told to speak a little bit more like this so that I sounded like a soprano. Oh, no. But that culturally would not fly. <laughs> Returning home after the first semester, talking to, hi mommy, like that would not work. But it was, it was supposed to teach me something about the larynx and placement and, mm -hmm. and to help me to make a part of my lifestyle the sort of resonance and positioning that would translate to the stage. And so I just wonder, um, because I'm fully confident in your ability to assess, do you think that uh, her designation as a contralto captures the moment precisely in terms of the qualities in her sound? Or you may not have any thoughts. Well, I'll have to spend some hours uh, giving her voice lessons to get, <laughs> give you that answer. I truly couldn't. I mean, this is, I guess, my always, I, I'm really hesitant of, of labeling voices. So um, I think it was, and I haven't done this archival work, but maybe it was a, a, even a political move to uh, a, a assign to that designation. I don't know, maybe you have the answer maybe to this. Do you? I mean, but I, I did sort of as a follow-up question. Do we know when did a Anderson get the label contralto? I mean, when I see her in the nineteenth, early nineteen thirties, it's already there in yeah, Berlin and in Vienna. Um, oh, is there, is there about eight years old? Yeah. Uh -huh. How do you know she's a contralto at eight? And I'm wondering. What? Yeah, and I'm wondering were they trying to account for what we've been referring to as the velvety warmer qualities in the voice and conflating that with range uh, because that was disturbing to me that she was referred to as on the programs as a baby contralto. <laughs> well, I think, it, yeah, so, so it's, <laughs> it might be a, just a really good way of being able to go outside of some of the other categories that could be used, right? And to definitely, it's a very classical designation. It suggests a classical voice, right? So maybe even that, instead of saying, uh, voice prodigy Marian Anderson, contra alto, immediately places her within the classical tradition. Um, I know that, um, uh, um, well, and, and also, um, 
these voice designation, as all of you know, they're not completely mapped onto to range either. It's about timbre, of course. So, but I, I don't know. I would really have to, to work with her to know <laughs> what her... I, I'm thinking about that designation and her early church work. It could have easily have been, mm -hmm. I got 10 girls here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to split five. You are soprano and you're the alto. Mm -hmm. Because it happened in the church, and who knows who who was training the kids, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. it could have been serendipitous. Actually, I thought it was interesting. It was there yeah. at eight. <laughs> it, that's kind of weird, though. Really, it's just curious for your adult. Yes. Oh my word. Thank you so much for really provocative stuff. I'm still wrapping my mind around it. And I like this response to this most recent question about is this sort of a politicized view and sort of what goes into put her in a classical world or maybe to put her, contraltos are so rare. And so to, it's easy to say, oh, well, here's this black woman. This is a rare thing. She's a contral. I mean, that seems to have a lot of resonance. But getting more to the, um, if I'm understanding your uh, the larger picture, and it seems like one thing you're doing is, and I'm thinking out loud here, this idea of how we listen at, and our internal and cultural way of categorizing voices. And I'm wondering, is there, I like this idea that there can be almost an objective or this larger, this aspirational idea of sort of how listening can happen. I'm also really aware though that given our individual experiences and due to the material s circumstances of how we are in the world, I bet that influences a lot on how we hear. So in your model, again, I'm, I'm still putting my mind around it, and I love the fact that we're trying to talk about categories and how Marian Anderson doesn't seem to fit easily <laughs> into them. Is there space for a listener, so to shift it onto the listener or the audience is one way I think of this, and how our different experiences affect how we're hearing this? In your first category, it sounded like it's very much based on what the listener hears, the listener's own experience. But is there a way to sort of intersect that with there are certain sounds that are connected and more culturally? I'm I guess what I'm trying to get is, are you saying there's a black way of listening, a white way of listening, these different cultural ways? That, that's really crassly put. But is there, uh, I'm interested more in sort of the categories of the listeners, perhaps, is a better way to say it. I think there are all kinds of ways of listening, um, and and I guess that this last. Uh, I'm afraid to go back to the slide. Um, um, oh, I want to see uh, here. Oh my! Contra. So he's trying to say that uh, none of these. Um, so, uh, so this, so the fir oh, uh, yes, you're wrong. this first category is just saying um, uh, you you hear me whether you see me or not. You say uh, who is this? Pro pops mm -hmm. up in your mind like a silent, silent acrosmatic question. Uh, it's an Asian woman, right? So that's like just uh, you are ascribing from whatever your pool of listening skills are. You ascribe something to me. So that's your. I have. I'm not in the picture. It doesn't matter who I am. Really, you just have it, and you can hear it on the radio. You know, oh, it's yeah. a black man. Oh, it's a white woman. Oh, it's an Asian. But and then here, we're trying to say, okay, here's the person, oh, if I listen now more, maybe it's early in, her voice is a little bit raspy, maybe, it's early in the morning, she's from the West Coast. So he's trying to describe some uh, um, particularities to the voice uh, that uh, come from the environment, etc. So I'm part of that picture, actually. Yes, I am. I, I did fly in from the West Coast, it's a little bit early, I was up there, etc. So this is affecting my voice. So it's actually, I'm here in this picture. And here we're really trying to sort of expand. Um, so then we went here first. I didn't have this in the first uh, uh, image I showed. Here then we're trying to um, include all these um, aspects. Okay, she's a foreigner. She's uh, she looks like an Asian, but her and her she has a kind of accent and uh, blah 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 blah. 
and so we try so it's a little bit like yours like all this um i, I don't know like where are we meet i'm not exactly sure, sure where we yeah. meet actually um, but we're trying to say this person has multiplicity right and okay. we can just add infinite infinite we can uh, put 100 labels on ourselves right so but i think this is where we want to end up because we can just expand 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 this and i think this is what happens in identity politics now we're just re refining more and more and more and more the pie to who we are right. in this uh, infinite in intersectionality, <coughs> which of course is very, very important. But, <coughs> um, but what I want to go is from here to here to say that each, each of these designations, even, even a foreigner, it, it, it's uh, created in a relationship. I'm not a foreigner in an, any kind of objective way. I'm a foreigner because we have nation states. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm a foreigner because we have passports and borders. I wouldn't be a foreigner unless that existed. So that's what I'm, I, I think I mean, I'm answering your question in a little bit <laughs> better way now, uh, Kara. I'm a foreigner only because of these circumstances. So that's why each of these you know, can only exist in a relationship. So each of these two only exists in a relationship. I'm only a woman in an environment, in a society where there are women and men and, and somebody in between, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it, any of these designations are created in a relationship. So I think that's my so nutshell. It's, I'm trying so to say it's structural. It's, it's, it's structural, exactly. Structure, yes. yes. And then the first flip that I, I think was a bit too long. My introduction, but this flip is really to say, like each time we hear a voice, it, I think the um, common model is that we think that when I hear somebody on the radio and I hear it's a woman's voice, I feel hundred percent sure I can trust that's a woman's voice. I don't question myself really, but sure. sometimes I do, and that's when I get uncertain. But I think that the sometimes when I do, that's actually what's the uh, reality all the time. But I'm so naturalized that I never question it. So that's the first kind of move I made at the beginning of this paper. Is I said, let's question ourselves anytime I say this is a woman. You know, how do I know? I know because this, 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 this. And, um, and it's not stable, right? Uh, so that's the first move. Anderson is like really insisting on some ways of, uh, of inhabiting the world. But others are insisting on other ways, right? So I think like what she's saying is like let's look at how these insistences came into place structurally, right? Yeah. Uh, and and let's see that we're creating them all together. And and the aspirational thing is then to really like, and I have a whole thing in the book um, uh, uh, about what I call the pause. Like each time this silent question comes up in our mind, like who is this? It's a man. Let's take a pause. Like, how, how did I come up with that answer to really look at the way I listen, to really listen to the way I listen and investigate that? And it's really kind of meditation practice. Uh, we can find our meditation practice right in that moment. Um, so I'm really, um, for me, it's become this whole new project, in fact. I spoke a little bit about it at Harvard. But, um, and I, I think this is really music theory. I want to write, the, what I'm doing now is, I want to write a music theory book where we, yeah, like how do we listen? Like why do we put, as I said a few weeks ago, uh, um, why do we put kids in a room in, in year one and then in year 15, they all come out with their little notation of exactly looking the same. They've heard a piece of music and they all come up with the same piece of transcription. Like how can that be? 15 completely different, well, many shared cultural affinities, but still, why do they hear all the, exactly the same when they're being asked to hear, uh, listen to a piece of music? They hear the same because they've been in culture to hear the same. And I think they also hear other things, but they're being taught to suppress it. So those are the wrong ways of listening. So I, I'm going to start a new project now where I'm going to do listening parties. And I just want to, <laughs> like, what do you hear that you don't dare to say that you hear, you know? And also it can be a sensation. It can be, it doesn't have to be like it's a hard sound or it's a this sound or that sound or it's a woman instead of a man. It's really just my toe is tingling. Like, why can't that be the answer when you transcribe uh, whatever piece, you know? Um, so, <laughs> so this is where Marin Anderson and other singers too have really are, shown me the path. I think our musicians are the ones who are theorizing for us. So we just have to pay attention. <laughs>